I want to welcome you here tonight for the second Ned Ames Honorary Lecture uh, at the Cary Institute. Uh, we set this up a little over a year ago to honor uh, Ned Ames' long contributions uh, to the Cary Institute uh, by virtue of his, what, 33-year trusteeship of the Murray Flagler Cary instrumental in uh, establishing the Institute uh, from the very earliest days, uh, all the legal papers and documents and bylaws and uh, getting it uh, on the right course that we enjoy today. Uh, he also uh, pulled me aside at a, a board meeting of the Southern Environmental Law Center a few years ago uh, and first planted the idea in my mind of, of coming here. Uh, so, to some extent, Ned, thanks for uh, being the impetus for uh, the move from uh, North Carolina uh, to Millbrook, New York. Uh, but Ned has done so much for the Cary Institute for so many years uh, that we're pleased to have this event uh, in perpetuity uh, to honor his contributions. Um, and, uh, and we're obviously very pleased to have you here tonight to enjoy that. Uh, Thank you. So, for the second uh, Ned Ames Honorary Lecture. Uh, I am also pleased to introduce Francis Beinecke. Uh, Francis is the uh, your title, Executive Director, President of the Natural, Report, Natural Resources Defense Council, better known as NRDC, uh, graduate of, of Yale College, uh, graduate of Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, uh, and has devoted her life to the preservation of environment. Uh, NRDC has been described a number of times as, you know, if there's a law firm for the environment, uh, NRDC is it. Uh, when she took over several years ago at the helm of NRDC, I think she epitomizes uh, the success, uh, the uh, fortitude, uh, and the fight that goes on uh, for better environmental preservation. Uh, many of you may know that Francis was selected by President Obama uh, to be a member of uh, his commission to evaluate the Deepwater Horizon uh, blowout and the subsequent oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. She spent uh, a large amount of time in late uh, 2010, uh, early uh, this year, uh, in uh, almost uh, sort of uh, you know, secret uh, capacity. You couldn't really talk to Francis about what was going on. Uh, but it's now, uh, with the report of that commission in hand, uh, has now uh, been able to talk about the, the issue of what they saw, what they heard, uh, what they recommended, and we're very pleased to have you here tonight to talk about uh, the Gulf oil spill one year after the greatest U.S. oil spill, lessons learned or not. Francis Beinecke, welcome. Exploded and uh, 11 men died on the rig. 
that day, uh, even more surprising, I'd say, was over 120 people got off of the race. And you hear about those who died, but when you read, actually, you have an opportunity to, and it's all on the web, our report, how harrowing it was for the people who needed to get off that rig uh, as it burst into flames, how unprepared they were uh, for um, the events that ensued, and how three major world companies, uh, British Petroleum, uh, Transocean, and Halliburton, uh, could have had the, the in our view, complete management breakdown that occurred that would have allowed this uh, to happen. That's really what we investigated, and uh, a lot came to light um, as a result. Uh, as you know, this well was 40 miles offshore. Uh, the, it's a deep water well, 5,000 feet below the ocean surface, and the well is 18,000 feet into the, uh, the substrate. Um, that sounds very uh, dramatic, but you should also know that we're uh, digging, drilling wells uh, much further offshore and much deeper, uh, not only in the United States, but in other parts of the world. Deep water drilling is part of the offshore environment now. That's where most of uh, the oil is coming from, uh, and that's where it will be coming from in the future. So we as a commission looking at this issue, we looked at where is the industry going, how do you ensure that there are maximum safeguards there. And I'll just pause for a moment, because I think if you look at our energy appetite, which is, as we know, uh, very, very large, just in the last year, we've had a major uh, uh, mining disaster in West Virginia where 29 people died. We had the Deepwater Horizon spill where 11 people died. We have the ongoing crisis in Japan and Fukushima uh, where that whole nuclear facility is in a, in a very, very uh, critical mode and having huge implications on the people who live nearby and the ecosystem adjacent to it. So the, the implications and the, um, the consequences of our energy appetite uh, are just considerable and it's something that we have to keep in mind because as we go forth, even as we want to promote efficiency and go to a clean energy future, and that is certainly the core of what NRDC stands for, we still have to ensure that all the traditional sources of energy that we use are operated with the maximum safeguards for humans, so that people's uh, lives are protected and work in these industries, but also for the environment that surrounds them. And that was an, an underlying <coughs> theme of uh, what we did on the commission. So we were appointed by the president. Actually, I'm proud of this because NRDC, early on, uh, as this bill um, came, you know, occurred, called on the president to create an independent commission. Um, and lo and behold, he did, and I was asked to sit on it. It was not a very large commission, only seven people. We had two fabulous co-chairs, Bill Riley, former EPA administrator under George Bush uh, 41, uh, Republican, uh, Governor Bob Graham, former governor and former senator of the state of Florida, really uh, wonderful uh, leader, both of them were, of this, of this enterprise. They had uh, great passion, commitment, very clear vision, and we entered into this uh, with the determination to try to come up with a consensus report that would really have impact on the issues at hand. And, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting. Get involved from the White House one will get to all this paperwork, suddenly you're in business, then the Wall Street Journal starts saying to the world that you, know, you are the wrong people to be doing this stuff. Uh, and, and I think I was the kind of epitome of why it was wrong, because how could seven people who didn't work in the petroleum industry ever look at uh, what happened uh, at the Deepwater Horizon? Well, you know, my answer to that is this is the biggest environmental spill ever, or oil spill in the United States. It's an environmental disaster. I think it's terrible to have one environmentalist on the commission. I mean, it seemed to me that that was pretty fundamental. But it did require us to dig out a little bit uh, in the public uh, mind. And we worked very hard on that. It was very important to us that as a commission we be fair, that we, have, uh, we reach out, that we uh, have a very detailed conversation with the oil industry about what happened, as well as with all the federal agencies that were part of the spill, as well as with the local governments that had to respond, as well as uh, all the industries uh, in the Gulf that were affected by this. We spent a lot of time down there, and we had several public hearings down there, and in Washington, we really spent a lot of time in the due diligence mode. Um, we had a six-month assignment, so we had to kind of get to work, do the investigation, come up 
uh, with our recommendations and get it all printed within a six month period, which I was proud to say uh, that we did. That entailed literally hiring executive director. We had a wonderful one, Richard Lazarus, who's the professor at uh, Georgetown University, who hired 50 people in about two weeks. And this, these 50 people, young, talented, committed, you know, working 24-7, got to work uh, as rapidly as possible to bring the information in because we were uh, very, with the uh, sort of shortest time um, commission that has been appointed, we actually completed our job on time, which was um, a tremendous challenge. And we worked, uh, as Bill mentioned, under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which is a very constraining statute, and it's kind of amusing because NRDC, we would all, always want to ensure that everything be done under FACA, but when you try to actually do something under FACA, you find out how incredibly difficult it is because you're not allowed literally to talk to one another except in a public meeting. Well, you know, it's very hard. The only thing we were allowed to do together was to have dinner on a company. You know, that was the only private setting they were allowed to. I think they thought, well, you don't have staff with you, you can't think of anything. So we actually had, we had very productive dinners. But, uh, you know, it, it is a challenge. I mean, I, I couldn't even uh, really um, take advantage of the deep knowledge that NRDC had because I had to really, I was appointed to the commission as an individual and I uh, had to do really the work uh, on my own. I felt that was a little bit limiting. The whole thing about NRDC is that we have the best staff in the business. I certainly wanted to take advantage of that, but um, I, I really, I couldn't. Uh, and I had to do it on my own, but in the end it worked out. So um, the spill itself, uh, I, I, I know that, I'm sure that everyone in this room saw that pulsating amount of oil and gas coming out for 100 days into the Gulf of Mexico. I think it absolutely riveted uh, the, the public. The fact that uh, the oil industry, so incredibly sophisticated, um, and it, they are sophisticated, we were, uh, really so impressed by the incredible complexity of the technology in drilling in 18,000 feet down, and for now there are 35,000 feet in some places. So here's one of the most complex industries on the planet. People equate this to uh, the equivalent of being in space, maybe even more complex because you can't see anything, everything is so remote. Uh, and yet um, the spill occurred and, uh, and the damage uh, to the area is just uh, considerable and ongoing. Um, the spill went on for 100 days. I think, as I certainly felt, and I'm sure many in this room felt that, well, this is the oil industry. They're going to figure out how to cap this. Well, we all watched them try to cap it with the top kill and the junk shot, and it took literally 100 days to get this under control. And so as a commission, our charge was to ensure that that did not happen again. Almost five million barrels of oil spilled in the Gulf of Mexico. It spilled, uh, it came out 40 miles offshore, so it dissipated quite a lot. And one of the big challenges over the summer was, where is this oil going? And um, is it, how much is evaporating? How much are they skimming? How much are they containing? Uh, how much, you know, where is it going? And what is the effect on the ecosystem that it's going into? And it, one thing you have to realize is there's very little baseline out there to begin with. Uh, so, you know, immediately, the scientific community wanted to go out there and collect, but the Coast Guard cordoned the whole place off. You couldn't go out there. You couldn't, you know, you, there was a, a ceiling for where you could fly over in that whole region because there was such a um, response effort. It wasn't really available to the scientific community. And there's a whole series of recommendations that I'll get into uh, in a minute uh, on um, what happened there. Also, the federal response. This, the response to something like this is under the Oil Pollution Act, which uh, passed in 1991 after the Exxon Valdez spill. So one of the things that was very surprising to us, and four members of the commission had actually worked as part of the response to the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska in 1989. Um, the technology hasn't developed very much since then, or I would say really not at all. That complacency had set in and that the oil pollution response that was designed after the Exxon Valdez spill was designed for a super tanker spill. So, you know, and actually on my very first trip before I was appointed to the commission and I met with one of the NOAA scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, he said, you know, we're really great at figuring out how to avoid the spill that just happened, 
but we're never prepared for the one that is happening now. Because you always design for what you know, and the future is always unknown. So, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to think through how do we create recommendations that are not designed for a Macondo blowout. Because the next thing is probably not going to be a Macondo blowout. It'll be something entirely different. And if we so narrowly confine our recommendations, it's not going to be that useful when the next thing happens. So one thing I think that I wanted to just impress upon you is that, and I, and I really felt this very personally when I was there, the, the human and economic uh, consequences of this bill are just enormous and ongoing. One well essentially put three industries out of business in the Gulf of Mexico. It put the oil industry out of business, it put the fisheries industry out of business, and it put the tourist industry out of business for months on end, for the entire summer. And for um, tourism and the fisheries industry, there's still a huge tarnish on the brand. And whether they can get that back, I think, is questionable, and they're very, very focused on it. But um, also, not only were the economic consequences enormous, the human uh, psychological social consequences were enormous. And you know, this is an area, I, I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure of spending time in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a fabulous part of the country. One of the great privileges is really being able to spend time down there and meet the people who live there and care so deeply about the Gulf. Their culture is just embedded in them. They, so many people have lived there generation after generation after generation, and the, uh, the integration between their love for the marine environment of the Gulf, their passion for fishing, and even working for the oil industry. This is all a very interconnected web for them. Um, and they're resilient. I mean, this, this is an area that is slammed by hurricanes on a regular basis. We think of Katrina, but the fact is that they've had three major hurricanes since Katrina. They know how to respond to disaster. They do it all the time. They're very resilient. But they told us time and time again how this was unlike anything that they had ever experienced. Because it went on for 100 days. Every day was as though a brand new spill was occurring. And the, the entire fisheries were shut off. And they had no way of knowing when it would be open. Could they get back to work? How were they going to survive? And although BP came in very quickly and put in their $20 billion fund for economic uh, relief, just the whole bureaucracy that had to be set up to respond to that and the kind of paperwork that was required that they just didn't have the, the, uh, the documentation for. But the complexity of this, four states of the United States were affected by this, you know, over the entire swath of the Gulf of Mexico. Little village after the little village, town after town, sh you know, shrimpers, oystermen, these um, Vietnamese shrimpers who came here 30 years ago, who really don't speak the language, and going to um, put in their claims in the Feinberg process, would there be translators? How, you know, what would happen to them when they went in there? There's so much uncertainty that the cycle, and actually I think it was in yesterday's paper, maybe today, there was a, another article about the psychological, in, in New York Times, the psychological impact uh, of this spill on that whole region. And, um, you know, one of the things I know that we as a commission felt very strongly about was if we can believe that in any way, that is a contribution that um, we really can make. And so it, the, uh, even though, you know, we're not looking at the spill anymore, the spills contain, the consequences to this whole part of the country are ongoing and they're really, really powerful. Not only was there a huge human toll, but the environmental impacts were considerable too. And uh, you know, this, this, is, this is the other thing about the Gulf of Mexico. This is an incredibly rich marine environment. This is a marine environment that is the workhorse for a lot of the nation. The whole central part of the country's uh, economy drains down, comes down on those ships through the Mississippi River, and crosses over and goes down to the Panama Canal or wherever they go. The, uh, the um, Gulf fisheries is the second most productive fishery in the country after Alaska. This is, uh, they have 28 marine mammal species, bluefin tuna, many, many species of sea turtle, that despite, you know, all of the intensity, and I, I don't know if I, I have, I had it with me, but I couldn't really display it for you, but the amount of oil and gas activity in the Gulf of Mexico is huge. There are more than 4,000 ongoing wells it is a workhorse of our energy environment. At the same time, there's this incredibly rich 
both um, commercial fishery and recreational fishery. There are uh, miles and miles of beaches where people go down for spring break and summer. I mean, this is a very heavily used place. And the Gulf is pretty resilient, but at this point, it's really suffering. There, the erosion, the degradation of the marshes, the um, impact of years and years of oil and gas development and uh, shipping uh, down the Mississippi have really had a degrading effect. And there have been many, many efforts to begin restoration in the Gulf. And that was an area, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, where we really felt the probably the most important lasting contribution we can make for the people of the Gulf of Mexico is to uh, really make a very strong uh, recommendation on how ongoing restoration should occur and how to make this region uh, more resilient going forward. So we, uh, we tried to do that in our final recommendations. So we looked at um, three general areas. So what's the responsibility of the federal government in providing oversight? What's the responsibility of the industry? What should they be doing that's different than what they've been doing in the past? And what does Congress need to do to enable these things to occur? Uh, in the first area, oversight and enforcement. I think one of the things that really struck us and we try to communicate as a result of this, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where this still occurred, is owned by the people of the United States of America. The oil and gas that lies under the seabed Seabed is owned by the people of the United States of America. This is not the oil industry's resource. It's our resource. So it's the federal government's responsibility to be the steward and to provide oversight for this resource. So in order for them to do that, they need a lot more um, authority than they have had in the past. And our conclusion really was that they have just been completely outgunned by the oil industry for the past, I'd say, 30 or 40 years. And uh, we have a lot of documentation of that. You know, the industry uh, is very sophisticated, as I mentioned, from an engineering standpoint. They're very powerful. They're also very proprietary. Each company wants to keep their own information very, very close. So uh, there's not a lot of shared information uh, among the companies about how you approach these things. So the, in, the, uh, the interior department, the now newly named agency, it was the Minerals Management Service. It's now the BOEMRE, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management uh, Regulation and Enforcement, um, they really were, I know, that doesn't blow up the top. And it doesn't even have a good acronym because BOMER isn't that good either. <laughs> but um, the, the, the reality is that uh, this is the Interior Department's responsibility, and they need to have uh, clear direction. They need more authority. They need to restructure themselves, and they need more resources in order to do that. And uh, the report actually documents quite carefully over the last 20 years how they've been starved of resources. Their budget has been constant. While this industry has gone further offshore, gotten larger, and become more sophisticated, and uh, and you know they, they just haven't been able to manage because really the industry has pretty well kept them from getting additional resources and developing that additional authority. And we had many, many examples of where interior would propose a regulation and it just never came out, it never happened. You know, I have to say, to their credit, since this bill occurred, uh, Secretary Salazar hired a guy, um, Mike Bromwich, who was a prosecutor in Washington, to take over Bomer and be the, uh, the director. And he has worked very hard to put in many of the uh, recommendations that we made. And he, I, I have to say, I mean, it's hard duty because every single day since the spill occurred, the industry has demanded that they get back to work in the Gulf. They want to get back to work, back to work, back to work. They and all the elected officials from the Gulf have just had an unending barrage against the Interior Department for spending the time to try to get it right so this doesn't happen again. And you have to be a tough person to put up with that because it's a very, very powerful industry. Uh, as I'll uh, point out in a minute. Um, in the area of spill response, this, this was uh, the, the, the area that I think um, surprised us in many ways. Right after the Exxon Valdez spill, there was tremendous work done for about five years on uh, research and development on technologies for how you clean up spills. Then everybody lost interest and nothing happened for 15 years. So Bill Riley, who was the EPA administrator during Exxon Valdez, he kept saying, I cannot believe it. These are the exact same technologies 
that we used 20 years ago. They weren't effective 20 years ago, and they're not effective now. And you know, one of our areas of recommendation was we have to invest in these things. You cannot have the kind of energy demand that we have, have these kind of sophisticated operations offshore, and not require both the industry and the federal government to make the kind of investment to make sure that you're prepared should something go wrong. Basically, complacency sets in. Nothing happens for a while, and people just lose sight of it. And as perhaps you all remember, everybody does an oil spill response plan. It's in the computer, they push a button, it comes out, it gets filed. Nobody's actually reviewing it to see if it uh, is on, uh, you know, adequate for what might happen. Nobody's looking to see is the equipment around and available uh, should a spill occur. And nobody's trying to improve performance uh, as we go along. So that's uh, one of the things that we looked very carefully at. After 100 days of this, it was very clear. There's only one thing that really works, and that's containment. You have to have the ability to contain the well because uh, burning does a little bit, not very effective. Skimming, very ineffective. Um, the booms were a good way to put uh, a lot of the fishermen to work. There was this vessel of opportunity program where literally thousands of boats went out with uh, uh, booms and skimmers to try to uh, pick up some of the oil, but it isn't really very effective. The only thing that really works is you've got to contain it at the wellhead and prevent the oil from coming out. They didn't have any containment. We all saw that. They had to build the structures over that 100-day period. They had three times uh, to do it. And the third time, they finally got it right. And then they built a dug a relief well uh, to intersect it when they finally uh, cut off the well in September. We can't afford that. So now the requirement is you cannot go in if you don't have containment uh, on site. And basically, the big, uh, big companies led by Exxon and an independent uh, consortium came together, and they're now two containment corporations in the Gulf of Mexico to be available on site uh, should something occur very, very rapidly. So that's very important. The third area was Gulf restoration. And as I mentioned, this is a hammered coastline. Uh, it has been abused and used, used and abused for a very long time. Getting uh, an actual restoration program going that is going to be effective over the long term. Not that you can fully restore the Gulf. This is a very eroded environment. But you can make it more resilient. And actually, the states have worked very hard to put in place plans. The federal government has put in place plans. But you need an entity to coordinate all these activities. And what you really need more than anything else is a steady stream of money for the restoration, probably over a 30-year period. We, um, we thought it was $500 million a year for 30 years, 15 to $20 billion to really restore the coast. And you know what? I don't know if anyone read uh, John Barry's book, The Rising Tide. He's a great author uh, from the Gulf about the big uh, flood in 1927. And he gave a very powerful presentation to us that truly really said, you know, this is an economic necessity. This region provides so much to the whole nation, particularly the drainage of the Mississippi uh, coming down um, through the delta that it's imperative not only for the uh, resilience of the ecosystem, but for the economy of that region for this ecosystem to be resilient. So there was a very strong economic as well as environmental mandate to make Gulf restoration a centerpiece of the report. And as I said, we thought that was the, the most long-term, uh, the most valuable thing that we could do long-term uh, because it is just such an incredibly rich, prolific, and fabulous environment, but it's not going to survive. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, New Orleans is not going to survive the sea level rise unless something starts happening pretty quickly, because all of the barriers that are there to protect it are pretty much uh, vanished. And then the fourth area is, is a scientific analysis. It, one of the other things we found is, um, as this offshore leasing program is developed, very little science was embedded in it, or at least embedded in the decision making. There have been scientific studies, they have an environmental studies program that's ongoing. But using the information from those studies in decision making just has not been happening. So one of the key centerpieces of what we recommended was to really elevate um, not only the investment in science, but the use of science in decision making going forward. So getting into the specifics a little more, uh, the Interior Department 
everything within this agency minerals management service. And one thing that is important to know about offshore, uh, the offshore program, not only are we addicted to oil, as we all know we are, and we have a drive for it and we use it all the time, um, but it creates also a tremendous source of revenue for the United States government. The offshore leasing program is the second largest source of income to the federal treasury after the tax dollar. So when we think, I mean, I've always thought, well, the drive uh, for oil in the Gulf or just across the country is because we're so addicted to oil, and it is. There's no question about that. But the revenue driver is equally important. As we're consumed by a conversation about the deficit every day in the news, you can see just how important this program is. And in fact, the only oversight the Congress has had of the offshore oil and gas leasing program in the last 10 or 15 years has been about the revenue generation. Nothing about the marine environment or the offshore leases or how the, what the safety uh, record is, nothing about that. All about the revenue. And I think once, once you pair the revenue with the oil, you understand how, uh, why it is there is such a powerful driver to continue this program going forward, and why, from our point of view, it was so important to ensure that the safeguards are at the maximum, because there's not a choice here. And a lot of people said to me, well, didn't you recommend that there be no drilling in the deep water environment? Well, we could have recommended that. I mean, there are plenty of people who would like no drilling in the deep water environment, but from a practical and pragmatic point of view, that wouldn't occur. So if, we, if that was the centerpiece of our recommendations, the entire report would have been dismissed because there's just so much, the drivers behind this program are so powerful. So from our point of view, it's much more important to make recommendations on how to maximize the safeguards and how to determine what areas ought to be protected uh, and how those areas should be protected while this goes forward. And then in our final chapter, we actually made a very strong recommendation that you cannot take this program out of the context of what a national energy policy for this country needs to be. But we're now, and I believe, the seventh president calling for a national energy policy. And we haven't gotten it since I started my career. And I'm not sure we'll get it before I end my career. I think that's a good bet. Um, so one of the things that was very important to us, and this is because of the power of the oil industry, is the final, the second recommendation was to create an independent authority in the interior. You have to separate the oversight authority from the industry to the maximum extent possible. Um, that's only possible with congressional activity, but we thought it was very, very important, and hopefully um, they'll get to that at, at some stage. We also thought there is a real responsibility for industry here. Uh, as I mentioned, industry, uh, they sort of go in on their own. I mean, Exxon and, uh, and Shell were careful to tell us that we would never have uh, drilled a well like that. That's the way we <laughs> drill the wells. And uh, so, but then he was, is always happy to say, well, you know, the commission found that this was a systemic problem across the industry. This wasn't our problem. Uh, but the fact is, it's everybody's problem. And they all have to get together to really improve the level of safety, to improve the management culture of the offshore environment. It's very much a kind of Wild West uh, um, cowboy kind of environment. Um, and it's very different. I think this is, uh, was a, somewhat of a surprise to us, but I think um, is very important to know. We examined how is this work done in other places, in other countries, particularly in the North Sea. Turns out uh, the UK and Norway have much higher level of, uh, of management oversight. They have a safety culture embedded in the offshore operations that just doesn't exist here. So that was a very center, you know, our, the centerpiece of the report was to maximize safety, to change the whole uh, sort of approach of the industry to maximize safety, to learn from what other countries were doing. And remember, it's a global industry. So, you know, Shell may do it one way in the Gulf of Mexico, but they're in the North Sea, too. So is BP. Now BP is going to be in the Arctic. We really need international standards here that everybody agrees to, that pulls everybody up. And in this case, what we recommended, too, and this was sort of um, something that was done after Three Mile Island in the nuclear industry, to set up an independent safety institute where they share information and really self-police one another and, uh, and push one another to higher standards. And it's not adequate for one company to say, well, I wouldn't do it that way, but that's the way they do it. They should all be doing it to the same, to the highest level of safety, and it should be improving 
level of safety on an ongoing basis. So that was an important recommendation. We also recommended that that institute be independent of the American Petroleum Institute, which is not only does set their, um, their standards, but also is their primary lobby arm. I have to say that that last part uh, has not been popular with the industry, separating it from the API. But that's uh, Bill Riley, particularly our co-chair, that's an area that um, he's pushing uh, very actively on. I think, so, you know, the industry is actually considering this recommendation. And as I mentioned, Interior is pushing forward uh, with their recommendations. I'd say they're about maybe 70% of the way there. But this is the tough one. There are a whole lot of things that require Congress. Last summer, Congress spent a lot of time talking about what uh, modifications needed to be made to the offshore uh, drilling program. That has completely fallen off the page. And actually, you cannot ensure the level of safety that we envision if Congress does not act. And um, you know, it's everybody's bet, anybody's bet, whether they will. A couple of the issues that they need um, to look at. One is the liability cap. After Exxon Valdez bill, they set the liability cap at $75 million. This bill is going to cost BP more than $40 billion. You know, a, a $75 million liability cap does nothing. In the first week, BP agreed not to uh, adhere to that cap, that they would pay what was, um, what, was due, what was their due. I think, you know, another thing to think about here, BP is one of the largest companies in the world. They can afford $40 billion. Well, that's fortunate because it's going to cost at least that much. But what if it had been one of the independent operators that has a well there that just didn't have that capacity? Who would be paying? Well, first of all, we would be paying, the American public. And secondly, there would be a lot less money available. So in some ways, you could say, well, gosh, it's just a good thing that it was BP and not one of these other independents. But that isn't the way it should be. So you have to set up an economic incentive system so there really is a consequence if you're out there and something bad happens. And that you are, you're either self-insured or you have insurance. The liability is high enough to improve your operations so that you can avoid this kind of um, activity. Secondly, the Clean Water Act fines. There are, is a fine for every barrel of oil uh, that spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. This might, might end up being in a big legal settlement with the Justice Department, but this is a fine that will be in the billions of dollars. And we felt now all fines uh, from the Clean Water Act over to the Federal Treasury. We thought again, because this is an area that has been so heavily used and abused in the past, that 80% of the fines should go to Gulf restoration. And if that happened, that would begin that, that stream of money that's so necessary to get the Gulf restored. I think it's probably, I mean, I know from the Gulf politician standpoint, it's the most popular recommendation we made. I also thought this might actually allow for a bipartisan breakthrough because the, 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 the governors, the states, they're dying to have this happen. And all the local electors are dying to have it happen. But we haven't had a breakthrough yet. I do think, though, uh, it could be one of the things that actually Happens. And then the final um, area of recommendation was, as I mentioned, this agency has been starved for 20 years. It cannot do its job with more resources. They have a $200 million budget in a program that brings hundreds of billions of dollars to the federal treasury. It's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense at all. But it's so highly political that to go through the annual appropriation process in Congress is very, very, very difficult. So we recommend, and this was actually Senator Graham's uh, very strong recommendation, that this um, industry pay for its own regulatory oversight, much as the uh, Federal Communications Commission and the NRC actually are all paid for by fees out of the industry, that that's a secure, steady uh, source of funds. Not surprising, that's proved to be very unpopular with the oil industry. <laughs> but uh, there are a lot of things that are very unpopular with the oil industry. But you know, one would hope that because of uh, the consequences of this bill, some of these log jams uh, would be broken, and uh, we're, we will. You know, we at NRDC and the other commissioners, uh, we were all kind of pledged to continue to work on this. And I think it's very, very important because I really feel that. Uh, the government has the responsibility, and we're in an era of smaller and smaller government, but for programs like this, where, that are, where so many uh, different resources are at stake, so many livelihoods uh, are at risk, that the government has a responsibility, and they have to 
be enabled to carry it out. I mean, it's one thing to give them the authority, but they also have to have the wherewithal to carry it out. And right now, they just don't. So in the, oh, wait, wait. In the area of science, I mean, this was, I think, um, very surprising. I don't think it was surprising to us. It was disappointing to us how low uh, science was in the consideration uh, the day-to-day -day decisions made about offshore drilling. Interior pretty much makes all the decisions. They have an environmental science program. It's kind of relegated to get some information, but not integrated in the decision-making process. They don't call on other agencies with real expertise. Most troubling was that they don't call on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, which is the lead, the lead oceans agency. They know about the oceans. They have, you know, they do the research. They have the experts. They, um, they have the information on what areas are at risk in the marine environment where the drilling is taking place. Um, shortly after the spill in July, the president announced a new national ocean policy that uh, that he's setting up an interagency task force where these conflicts are to be worked out. So it was critical from our point of view that NOAA be embedded in the leasing process. And in one of our um, hearings, the uh, head of NOAA, Jan Lepchenko, who's just a world-class, fabulous scientist, you should have her come up here and speak sometime, she's so great. And uh, uh, Nancy Sutley, who's the head of the Council on Environmental Quality, both testified that they had never been consulted on the offshore leasing program. The president last March announced a new five-year leasing program in the Atlantic and the Gulf. Um, thinking about the Arctic and the lead ocean agency was not consulted in any way. You know, how could that be? So, you know, we made very specific recommendations on how to bring NOAA much more into um, the discussions of where, because we're not going to be in a position uh, about, you know, leasing isn't going to occur. In fact, today, uh, President Obama was in um, Pennsylvania talking about energy and he talked about offshore drilling. In, um, in the Atlantic and in the Arctic. And as long as we have this drive for oil, they're going to drive for where the oil is. So it's just imperative to have as much information as possible and make decisions to ensure that these conflicts don't occur and that areas that are incredibly productive for marine life are identified and protected going in and that there's systems in place to do that. And that just uh, doesn't occur um, at the moment. Very much in our minds during the whole um, uh, investigation was the fact that the industry is driving to the Arctic. The Arctic is the last undeveloped ocean on the planet. And the ice is melting, and the industry is ready to dive in. The oil industry, the fishing industry, the shipping industry. They are pouncing as soon as they can get in there. And much of the undiscovered oil in the world is expected to be in the Arctic rim, in Russia, in Canada, and in the United States. So we knew that whatever we do in the Gulf of Mexico, we have to look very carefully at the Arctic. So what we did was we decided, well, it's not our job to make a decision on whether or not Arctic drilling takes place. We don't have that authority. But we can look at what do you need to know, and when, and when do you have to have that information. So we identified that there was a very serious research gap in the Arctic, that there is you know, there is um, much available information, but not integrated in a way that they can use it to identify where to go forward or where not to. And there's also a huge response gap. Remember, 40,000 people were employed to respond to the Deepwater <coughs> Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Thousands of boats were deployed. You know, Tens of, I, mean, I don't even know how many miles of boom uh, were de deployed across the Gulf of Mexico. In the Arctic, uh, in the Chukchi Sea and in the Beaufort Sea, that kind of response effort is just not available. The closest Coast Guard facility is 1,000 miles away. So you know, we said, before you go into the Arctic, first of all, you've got to know what's there. You've got to identify what areas to protect and what areas you know, you could go forward and you have to figure out what your response capacity is. You have to deploy the response capacity and be ready. You know, you just can't go in there because even though the conditions are quite different, it's not deep water drilling with the pressures that are exist in the Gulf of Mexico is much shallower. But the conditions are so challenging. It's dark a good deal of the year. It's frozen a good deal of the year. There's terrific storms. Um, there's fog. 
tremendous amount of the time. How do you respond if something happens and you can't see it? You know, they, they have a theory, well, you know, the, the, the oil will flow out on the ice and then we'll wait till it melts in the summer and then we'll go collect it. Well, you know, who knows if that would work. It didn't sound very real to us. So uh, a federal research program on the Arctic was very, very important. The science so far, I'm not going to get into this uh, in any detail, but this, this bill occurred, uh, the first thing that happened, as I mentioned, is the Coast Guard sort of put a lot of the area off limits. So, you know, it, it took work for the scientists. There weren't that many research festivals. They had to bring in all the NOAA research vessels from around the world. It was hard to go in and get the basic data. So uh, they, they have been under the uh, Clean Water Act, there's the, Nat, um, NERDA, the Nat, uh, Natural Resource Damage Assessment Program, which will, is another source of fines to determine actually how much damage there was to the ecosystem. But you can only do that if you have the baseline information. So uh, the Interior Department, Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA have deployed across the Gulf to get as much baseline data um, as they could. The Natural Science Foundation had a rapid response program where they put out about $19 million of uh, grants for science research. But this is long-term research. I mean, and so they're beginning to get the information. They're now uh, looking at um, the chemistry, um, what happened to the oil, basically. And then they'll start looking at the biology. What are the long-term impacts? And although some of the impacts are acute, probably the chronic impacts uh, over a long period of time are going to be more consequential. At least that was what was found in Alaska. So it's going to take a lot of time to get to the point um, of getting that information. But you know, I, I guess our main conclusion was you need to invest. You need to invest in the science before uh, you go out into an offshore environment. You need an ongoing monitoring program. We actually suggested that they have monitoring on the rigs. The rigs are all out there. They could easily put some monitoring equipment and be streaming that information in on a regular basis rather than having to deploy ships all over the place. It would be a more effective and efficient way to do it, and you could make it a requirement of the lease so that the industry had some responsibility up with it. And um, we also thought that you have to have, uh, of course, after the fact, you have to have research going on to see what the long-term impact was. Uh, so this is, um, this is just looking first at the chemistry, the Exxon Valdez, and um, so where are we right now? Well, we completed uh, our report in um, January. We took it to the White House. We delivered it to the President. And uh, let me just talk about that for a minute. It's pretty interesting. Uh, the President was there, and he was surrounded by what I call was his oil cabinet. So he had uh, Jane Lubchenco from NOAA. He had Lisa Jackson from the Environmental Protection Agency. He had Janet Napolitano from the Homeland Security Agency because she has the Coast Guard. Uh, uh, Sal, um, Secretary Salazar from Interior, Secretary Chu from the Energy Department, John Holbrook, Chief Science Advisor. They were all there, and we were surprised. But what we realized in the course of this conversation, this group had lived and breathed this spill every day for 100 days. They spoke twice a day, 7 a.m. in the morning, 5 p.m. in the afternoon. They deployed 40,000 people across the Gulf of Mexico to clean this up. They worked as a team day in and day out to try to respond to this thing which was unfolding for them. And it was very personal to them. They had put in so much time. They had bonded as a group. You can see that, just being with them. And they were deeply interested in both what our findings were and what needed to happen going forward. I was particularly impressed. They were very focused on the restoration issue because I think they had all made so many trips down there, they realized how in need this region was of restoration, how important it was for the long-term resilience, not only of the natural environment, but for the human environment. But they were also very focused on the Arctic because they know that that is where the pressure is going to come uh, coming forward and how that's handled is going to be very, very important. And just on that point, this is, as I mentioned, an international industry. They're all over the place uh, globally. Russia, Canada, Greenland, uh, Denmark, Norway, the US. Having international standards through the Arctic Council or the, uh, a group of international regulators to determine what are the appropriate uh, operational standards 
for operating in New York. It was the next major thing. You cannot do this country by country. That also applies, interestingly, in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, we think of the Gulf of Mexico basically as if the U.S. is out there drilling. But uh, Mexico is out there drilling, and Cuba is about to be out there drilling with Gazprom as the driller. And where Cuba is drilling in the deep water is right next to Key West and the Florida Keys. So when people were concerned during the Macondo spill, the deep water rights spill, that that loop burn was going to go and uh, go off the coast of Florida and possibly even come up the East Coast, much greater uh, risk with the drilling immediately adjacent uh, in Cuba and what kind of standards are they going to be operating under. So interestingly, just this week actually, there's been a meeting convened in Mexico, and Mexico is offered to sort of be the convener of the U.S and Cuba to try to figure out what the operating standards uh, for the Gulf of Mexico should be. So I think that's a heartening sign. You know, when a spill occurs of this magnitude, and you know, hopefully there'll never be a spill of this magnitude again, it does focus everybody on what needs to happen. The next thing is to put in, implement the recommendations that we made, and there are a lot of other investigations too, I didn't go into those, but there are quite a few others. Uh, but also to figure out how to avoid complacency and how to ensure that people keep their attention on this issue going forward. We thought one of the important ways to do that was to have local advisory committees. Because the people who care the most about this are the people who live there. And that's what uh, was set up actually after the Exxon spill. There's two regional advisory committees. And they keep everybody on their toes because they don't want that to happen again. And they're paying attention to the industry each and every day. And I think that would work well uh, in the Gulf, too, because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the impact on people's lives, tens of thousands of people's lives, is really unparalleled there. I mean, it, it, is, it is hard to imagine how much impact and how enduring the impact is and really how it's changed people's lives. And, you know, that should not happen. As we develop an energy policy and we need one that is comprehensive, that's much more efficient, that's much cleaner and that really looks at what the risks and hazards of each and every source are, you know, we need to ensure that we do these things with the maximum protections to ensure that the environment can endure and can continue to supply the rich materials that we depend on and that depend that are um, keeping that environment going, going forward. So that was very much central to what we were thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm proud of what we came up with. I think the recommendations are strong. Of course, somebody has to implement them, and we continue to work on that. But even if that does take time, I think that it, the report <coughs> identifies the kinds of things that need to be top of mind as we struggle with, I think, one of the greatest challenges the country faces, which is how do we supply energy for a population in this country is 350 million, worldwide 7 billion, going to 9 billion, and yet we require it for everything we do. These are enormous challenges and we have to take them on directly. We have to ensure that we move as rapidly as we can to much cleaner, much more efficient sources of energy, but we also have to ensure that the traditional fossil sources that we use are conducted with the maximum safety that we can possibly design. And that was the mandate of the commission. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. I um, know, as I said to Bill going in, I know too much about this particular topic that uh, I only barely scratched the surface, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Because they make a ton of money. 
And I actually thought, and I don't know if I said this, but they should be the strongest proponents for the changes. And the reason is that they want access. They want to be in the water. We heard that you know, a million different ways from them. The soonest and best and most effective way to get at, back there is to ensure that the safeguards are, and, and the resource, the capacity of interior to do its job is there. I, you know, I have the same view for the natural gas industry and the fracking issue. I think these industries that want to produce these resources and that we're depending on, they ought to be the strongest proponents for the strongest safeguards. They can meet them. They're making tremendous amounts of money for this. So we didn't. We think the greatest incentive for them is to have access to this incredibly valuable resource, which earns them literally billions of dollars. Do you favor one over another? Companies? Yes. Yeah. Well, Exxon's more responsible. I think Exxon, I mean, I know. Exxon learned a lot from the Exxon Valdez bill, and their operating standards, I'd say, are the very highest. That, you know, we heard it again and again that Exxon is the best run company. Do you rig it to get the leases to Exxon? Um, I know rig it from here. <laughs> but I mean, I think that that's an issue. I mean, one of the things that are sort of embedded in the report is what kind of conditions should be on, what you have to be able to show in order to have access to these leases, and that the standards have to be a lot higher. That, you know, you, you have to have the capacity to respond. So a company like Exxon or Shell, which are the two highest, but you know, one thing that happens, they go out and get the leases, they quickly, or not so quickly, but you know, they, they drill them, they get the resource, and then they turn the leases over to another company, independent, smaller. I'm not saying um, poor operator, but things can happen. This is a very risky business, and you have to assume, in every case, that the worst case can happen. Otherwise, they're not prepared for it. And in fact, the Interior Department had um, deleted the worst case assessment from their permit requirements. They weren't doing the worst case anymore. Because they said, well, you know, it's not going to happen because we have this great, very sophisticated drilling technology. Well, how wrong were they? And it all, I mean, one rig knocked three industries out of business for months on end. <coughs> the impact of it was huge. Over here. Oh, he's on. I guess he's doing Yes? Isn't it asking the hen to write the rules for the hen house if you ask these industries to do the regulation? Oh. In the case of Macondo, they use substandard pipe, from what I understand, to do the drilling, and the pipe was an inadequate diameter at the depth that they were drilling, well, and this was due to Halliburton. So well, there are three companies, Transocean, Halliburton, and uh, BP. They were all involved. We, we actually, in the report, go through chapter and verse, how they designed the well, what happened in the cementing, what happened to the drilling budget, what happened to the negative pressure test, the positive pressure test. There were dozens of indicators that things were going wrong, and yet they didn't see it because they didn't have a management system that allowed that. That was, um, that was pretty shocking. We're not recommending that they do the regulation. We're recommending much stronger oversight by the Interior Department and that the, at the, and that the oversight agency be truly independent uh, as a regulator and not have anything to do with the leases you know, or the revenue or any other aspect of it. It really has to have a firewall so you don't have these embedded relationships. Very, you're absolutely right about that. On the energy horizon, uh, I think we know that the uh, solar energy storage problem exists because we can't transfer it from the southwest to the you know, other areas of the country. But you know, when we're talking about deep water drilling, um, is there any investigation into um, tidal power, tidal surge turbines, and the oil companies transferring from our dependence on oil, which we know the outcome of, you know, it's the melting of the polar caps and, you know, the continued usage of that. So I guess my question is about um, tidal surge power. Um, there are there is work being done on that. It's not deployed at this point. And the you know the oil companies are oil companies. If you ask them, that's what they do. Uh, that kind of alternative energy development will no doubt be done uh, pretty much by others. I mean, you know, the one thing that's interesting. I'm sure you all remember when BP became beyond petroleum, and you know, I say we the environmental community were taken in by that without they had done big investment in other sorts of energy. How long were we? I mean. Just, you know, they had a great branding program and, and uh, I think many of us bought into it and very incorrectly. That's not where the alternative investments are being made. Some are, but 
you know, they're, they're independent companies, independent entrepreneurs. And, I mean, one thing, I just came back from a think tech conference that Fortune Magazine held in California yesterday, Fortune Green. One thing that's very exciting is the number of clean tech entrepreneurs all over the country, in fact, all over the world, who are looking for solutions, looking, uh, you know, developing products, looking for investors. I mean, there's tremendous effort, energy going into that field. It's tiny compared to what our traditional sources are, and that needs to shift. But I think it is exciting that there is so much interest and commitment to it. It's, I mean, you just feel it. You have people coming in all the time with it's kind of unfortunate when, when the oil companies have all the drilling equipment, they've got all the knowledge, the technology, technological knowledge, and if they could just transition into, you know, turbines and... Yeah, well, I mean, it's a big transition. It is a huge transition, and not only for us, but for the world. I mean, it's, we have a long way to go. Uh, if we were lucky enough to collaborate internationally with high Standards for um, this situation. What guarantees could be implemented to assure that we wouldn't run into a situation such as George Bush walking away from the Kyoto Protocol? Uh, that's a complex question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no guarantees. No, no guarantees. I mean, you know, we we're. Uh, we need to get very serious about what the challenges are. And I, you know, it's interesting. I, you travel around the world, other parts of the country are a lot more serious about doing something about the issues of climate change uh, than we are. Uh, and, you know, for us, it's become a scientific debate, a partisan issue, it's so toxic, you can't even begin uh, to comprehend what a, what a, what a an agreed upon national approach would be. So I think the answer uh, to global warming is you basically have to do as many pieces as you can. You need pieces in the transportation sector, in the power sector, you need cities to take leadership, states to take leadership, you need the administration to take leadership with the authority that they've got, and you have to hope that you move towards some more comprehensive approach, but at this point, and Tom Lumber is here, he's actually an expert on this, I don't see a comprehensive approach either in the United States or worldwide being agreed to any time soon. Perhaps one more? But that doesn't mean you can't make progress. You know, you really can make progress, but the sort of all wrapped up in a nice bow, I just don't see that. We had our window to do it, we didn't do it, and I don't see it any time soon. Way in the back there. Uh, thanks for uh, giving the talk tonight, thanks for being on the committee. Uh, I have a question about the local advisory councils yeah. that you mentioned. So I was pretty disheartened. Uh, so when President Obama called for a moratorium on drilling, a lot of the people that had been directly affected by the, the, the spill were against his moratorium. Yeah, everyone who testified in the Gulf of Mexico was against the moratorium, everyone. And, and, and I, so I, I have a question it. whether the, the local people are just too uh, strongly tied to the gravy train of the oil spill of the oil um, you know, I, Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think um, this is their community. This is where they live. Uh, there's no one else who can provide that kind of day-to-day -day oversight. I mean, there are people who are deeply committed to doing it better. You know, what we, I mean, we were in favor of more term, just interior, how to get its act together, no question about it. I mean, we, not the commission, the commission didn't take a position. We had different views of the commission. But, I'm saying I was. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that you really heard was, you know, the, the way that people felt was the tourism industry is out for the season. And the fishing industry is closed down. So, and it's not going to be reopened until they contain this thing. The only thing we've got is the oil industry, so you should let us get back to work. Um, you know, that, I mean, it's, you got to spend time and understand people work in, you know, one or the other or both at the same time. It's just, it's embedded in their culture. It's part of the fabric of who they are. They don't look at it uh, the same way we do. But they also, I think it was very important, looking at where's our livelihood? How do we get paid? Who's going to pay us? Everything's shot. So, you know, and that, these, you know, in many cases, these are people who don't have large incomes and were scared to death. And in many respects, still are. So.
So, you know, you got to have a different economic plan, but you can't do it overnight. Although it's interesting because we met with Mayor Landrieu from uh, um, Senator Landrieu's brother, who's the mayor of New Orleans. The thing he was most proud of was the turbine wind factory, which had just landed in New Orleans. So, I mean, even there, they're beginning to think of, you know, alternatives uh, and, and different sources and understanding that, you know, the Gulf resource is running out. The reason, one of the reasons we're in the deep water is that all those wells in the shallow water are pretty much exhausted and the resource is in the deep water, but that's going to leave to at some point. So, you know, they do need a different economic future. But, you know, I think uh, in the course of the summer, the moratorium issue was, it, there was a lot of fear around just surviving. And I think that's a lot of where that came from. Francis? Yes? Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>